Yes, let's get started. So our last speaker today is Ellen Landemore. Uh, she is speaking from New Haven. Very nice weather, I can see out of the window. Yes, yeah, nice to see. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, Brenton Hogan is then gonna comment briefly on Ellen's talk, so please. Okay, well, thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you for inviting me, Jan. Uh, it's always a pleasure. So the title of my talk is Democracy in the Time of Cholera, and I gave it a slightly uh, more specific subtitle, which is Keeping Citizens on Top and Experts on Tap. So I, I just want to start with sort of two thoughts that have emerged from this turmoil of the, of the pandemic for me. So the first one, um, is about the way you know we we, we need to to um, change the way we treat essential workers and real economy jobs. Um, it's clear that the current status of uh, of these essential workers is not um, proportional to their actual social utility, and that there's something deeply wrong with the way we, we, we run this economy. Uh, I uh, want to keep this thought for another time, though. Um, in fact, for tomorrow, when uh, an op-ed on the need to democratize work I co-signed with uh, more than 3,000 academics worldwide is going to be published in 27 countries around the world. Um, I can't say much more about this, but I think it's really important and I, I just wanted to use this opportunity to plug it because I think it's really um, something important and I encourage you to stay tuned. The other thought I had, which I will explore here, is uh, about uh, the question of how democracy can handle times of crisis like this one. So what I broadly refer to as the time of cholera, if you will. Um, could be a pandemic, but it could be an economic crisis, a war, any situation that seems to demand swift decisive actions um, rather than the inclusive and often slow moving deliberations and negotiations that we associate with a uh, more democratic decision making. Uh, it's always been a critic of democracy that it's bound to do worse than autocratic regime on this kind of in this kind of situation in this time of cholera uh, because sacrifices are required tough trade-offs uh, need to be made and all of that on a background of great uncertainty and urgency and i've seen a lot of people trying to draw conclusions already from the different performance of different countries on on on, on, on the, the you know the, the way they've addressed this pandemic it's true that we, it feels now that we are um uh, stuck in a, in a giant global social experiment uh, to test the epistemic properties of different regime forms around the world. Even 2008 didn't have quite that absolutely global dimension because not all countries are, were exposed in the same way to, um, to the financial crisis. So it seems to be a, a very unique uh, event in, in world history. And the question is who, when the dust settles, will have addressed the crisis best in terms of uh, minimizing the death toll by acting fast and efficiently enough, preserving fundamental civil rights in the process, maintaining standards of social justice and the possibility for economic recovery, all relative to a, a country's initial um, conditions. And what will they say of the respective merits of democratic versus um, autocratic countries, but also versus uh, so centralized versus decentralized countries, small versus large countries, homogeneous versus less homogeneous countries, um, countries with individualist values versus countries with uh, collectivist or sometimes called Confucian values. And a few weeks ago, uh, everything seemed very unclear. We had uh, democratic Taiwan and authoritarian Singapore as role models, while authoritarian Iran and democratic Italy were sort of the worst case scenarios. Um, and today it seems to me that uh, uh, despite what each camp claims for the favor regime form, things are equally murky. Uh, Singapore does not look so good anymore. It has proven to have crucial blind spots, ignoring the fate of foreign workers and letting a huge cluster develop in their midst and get out of control. China, the largest autocracy on earth, impressed the world initially with its capacity for radical action imposing massive quarantines on millions of people, building hospitals, uh, hospitals in eight days or fewer. And then as the epidemic came slowly under control, sending millions of masks and airlifting expert teams around the world to help other countries, including the US. At the same time, China is responsible for badly bungling the initial phase of its response to the epidemic, 
with a state cover-up uh, of the outbreak that ultimately wasted crucial weeks, doomed many lives, and made it all but impossible for the virus not to create a global pandemic. On the other side of the world, one of the largest and oldest democracies, the United States of America, wasted precious weeks pretending COVID-19 was nothing but a bad flu, and to this day has been unable to provide its population, including its essential health workers, with um, enough masks and tests. In France, my, my own country, um, a democracy with strong paternalistic tendencies, the government told the noble lie that masks were not useful for a long time, but that's what they claim, and even positively harmful for people who didn't know to put them correctly on, only to contradict themselves weeks later when it became obvious that this lie was not tenable and when mask, uh, and when, when it became obvious that countries that did the best actually were, were countries where masks were widely uh, worn by, by people. So to me, there seems to be both good and bad, and, and mostly bad outcomes, actually, among both democratic and undemocratic countries. I'm not sure we can conclude anything at this point. Many want to conclude that we need more expert rule um, or more epistocracy in the age of pandemics. I tend to think we probably need more citizen participation and involvement um, still. And at any rate, I don't think COVID-19 will be the right occasion to settle this kind of debate. Uh, it could be that the only difference between countries that did well and those that did not do so well in is, is uh, whether or not they had recent experience with similar epidemics or uh, relatively similar traumatic events. And at any rate, reaching such conclusions will depend on mobilizing complex methods allowing us to find correlation between certain regime features and certain outcomes, controlling for all kinds of cultural, economic and other factors including the fact, for example, that the uh, epidemic didn't affect all countries at exactly the same time, but sequentially, and so there might be countries that actually learn from other people's mistakes. And pending this kind of results, uh, even assuming that democracies did not do well in this particular crisis, I think we should resist the claim that COVID-19 is the ultimate test of the epistemic superiority of democracy, uh, or conversely, the litmus test of its inferiority. Put, them, put simply, democracy in the time of cholera is uh, like love, uh, complicated, uh, flawed, painful, and the experience of its worth and value is bound to be much delayed. In fact, we shouldn't assess regime forms on their ability to deal with one issue alone, but on their ability to handle constantly changing bottles of issues over time. Over time. So my previous work, which I am not going to rehearse here, um, I have argued that when it comes to doing that, dealing with the uncertainty of constantly changing bundles of issues, democracy is in a better position than less inclusive and egalitarian regimes because it leverages better the power of cognitive diversity in bringing to bear on these constantly and unpredictably changing bundles of issues the whole range of um, perspectives and information contained in its population. And by contrast, Autocratic regimes, even the most epistocratic ones like uh, China, which after all is, is supposed to be a meritocracy, um, uh, are bound to uh, uh, have more cognitive blind spots than, than more democratic uh, groups of decision makers. They will tend to bring to bear on collective decisions two homogeneous sets of minds. So, Rather than focus on, on democracy versus epistocracy here, uh, as perhaps I was expected to, I actually want to ask um, a different question, and in my view, a more urgent question, which is how do we reorganize or reinvent in democracy? And by experts here, I mean uh, not just doctors, epidemiologists, virologists, but all the people identified as uh, having expertise on some subject through their educational credentials or their um, demonstrated uh, practice, by contrast with ordinary citizens who are identified only through their citizenship and in practice the, the, the right to vote. So traditionally there have been uh, various positions clashing with each other, right? On the one hand you have so-called populists who want to do away with experts, um, and other eggheads, as they call them, to, who are supposed to corrupt the will of the people. And on, on the other hand, you have technocrats who would, by contrast, 
minimize what they see as incompetent and fickle democratic interference, and instead centralize more power into ever-expanding bureaucracies and expert-led agencies. So in the time of cholera, again, time of, of uh, urgency and, and, and crisis, the latter camps, the, the, the expertocrats, the technocrats, the epistocrats, seem to have more of a point. Why wouldn't we want more power to uh, Dr. Fauci, for example, and less to elected representatives, even if they're not uh, as crazy as Donald Trump? Genuine Democrats, in response, face a difficult uh, challenge because they cannot fight the urge to transfer power to the experts without being seen as siding with the populace to some degree, without being seen as resisting knowledge and, um, and uh, expertise. So it's a really important question for us. In a globalized age of wicked problems and extreme division of labor, in the face of systems complexity, in the time of cholera again, how do we best articulate the power of citizens and of democratic representatives to the knowledge of experts? How do we include experts in the decision-making process while preventing them from capturing it? So my argument will be that, um, as per my title, we need to keep citizens on top and experts on top. And it's much harder to do than you think. Um, and I'll, I'll, um, I, I won't give you the, the, the answer on how to do it or do even do it you know, well, or, 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 uh, or and I'm not gonna give you any kind of blueprint, but I, I wanna focus on the combination of two approaches. One is the use of lotocratic representation, so assemblies of uh, randomly selected citizens with their own legislative autonomy that have, th these assemblies have the merit compared to elected assemblies of avoiding the extreme professionalization and um, that, that elected assemblies uh, uh, have after a while and, uh, uh, um, and, and, and introduce a lot more diversity as well into the, the pool of decision makers. And within those assemblies, so that's, that's an argument that I'm, I'm not going to go into, I, I'm making it in a, in a book uh, that uh, is forthcoming, but uh, within those assemblies, and there's a secondary and very important question as well of how do you um, articulate the, the expertise and knowledge of citizens themselves to that of the experts that are supposed to be there to help them to uh, make low, law proposals or, or policy recommendations. And uh, this relationship to, to, to be well um, defined requires a transformation of both groups and the nurturing of a relationship of trust and respect anchored in a clear division of labor and a sense that the citizens are the ones who are in charge of giving the direction and the experts are there to help make their, to help them make their vision concrete. Uh, we don't have a lot of evidence about the, the interaction that really work, the, the sort of incentive structures and, and protocols that make that happen. Um, I, I've looked at what happened in Iceland in, uh, in 2010-2011 in, in the way experts uh, shaped or not the constitutional proposal. I'm not going to rehearse that here, although it was very interesting and, and actually convinced me that experts really need to be reined in. Instead, I want to focus here on a very specific example, which I, I, um, I've been following for uh, more than six months now, uh, the Citizens' Convention on Climate Change. So, for those of you who are not familiar with this uh, convention, it's a, a group of 150 randomly selected citizens from all of our friends that has been convinced by President Macron in October of last year to prepare the green transition in a spirit of social justice. And what Macron, so, so this came on the heels of all kinds of social movements. We had the yellow vest, uh, lots of uh, you know, uh, demonstrations against uh, pension plan reform. Um, Macron tried to sort of fix the, 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 this bad dynamic with uh, uh, the so-called great national debate. And at the end of the so-called great, great national debate, he, he created this assembly of 150 um, randomly selected citizens assembly to basically give them a little bit more power and let them come up with proposals on how again to, to, to get to, uh, to, to, to basically reduce our, our um, green gas emissions. Uh, so it's been going on since October. It's been delayed in various ways, first by the social movements and then by, by COVID-19 because, uh, you know, this can't take place in, in, um, in, in the building anymore. So they're doing it online. They've done um, one session online and, and they're going to wait until the end of June to finally conclude their work and perhaps uh, meet again physically in the, uh, 
you're not Palais in Paris. Um, and what's really interesting is how the role of uh, expert has grown enormously in this uh, convention over the seven, uh, the, the six sessions that I've observed, six and a half actually. And, uh, and how at the same time, the citizens have grown themselves into new kinds of experts and have grown into their own sense of power and, and sovereignty. And so it has created all kinds of really interesting clashes. So I'm just gonna give you some, some actual detail and some actual um, a description of what happened and, and try to derive some conclusions from that, although it's probably a little premature, but I, I'll try nonetheless. So let me first go to the, 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 the recount first, the first meeting uh, uh, on October 4th, um, 2019. So the meeting started, you know, a very typical top-down, very formalistic, I, I, I think paternalistic way, that's, that's the way the French do things always. Uh, it was a lot of lecturing at the citizens. They spoke almost uh, not at all the whole um, session. They spoke maybe a total of two hours, if I'm, if I'm counting generously. Um, on the first night, they had to listen to experts um, uh, of climate change using what, what you know, was definitely a, a progressive model of a flipped classroom, right, where questions from the citizens were supposed to come first and experts were supposed to answer them. Uh, so that the idea by the organizer, which is a really good one, was to custom tailor really the, the, the presentation by experts to the needs, to the expressed needs of citizens. So the experts were Valérie masson dermot a French climate scientist, and Laurence Tubiana, a French economist, academic and diplomat, also co-president of the Governance Committee of the Convention, which is a, a bizarre mixing of the roles, but I won't go into that. So at the beginning of the session, here's what I observed as I reported in my notes. The experts introduce themselves briefly. The organizer tells people to take a few minutes to write down what they want to ask. Then the floor is open to them. Citizens ask questions. They um, have a humble sort of posture and attitude. They have open and smiling faces. So here are some of the questions they asked. What caused earlier coolings of the earth? Could we perhaps recreate such conditions? You are the experts. What solution do you think should be implemented? Why is the baseline 1990? That's a benchmark for cu cutting uh, green gas emissions by 40%. Is the emergency technological or relative to human beings? Can you give us some news about the ozone layer? So as you can tell, very naive, very innocent, factual questions uh, directed to the experts. The answers from uh, the climate change experts came in the form of a 40 minute PowerPoint. In fairness, it was a pretty good, very good PowerPoint, uh, but it was a bird's eye view perspective. It was very general. It was a flood of facts and um, very overwhelming, too overwhelming probably. So I noticed lots of crossed arms. Some people take notes, closed faces, some look elsewhere. As an observer, you got a sense that the experts couldn't help themselves. The organizer had flipped the class, but the good old lecture format came back anyway. So the second day, they tried to fix things because it didn't go well, obviously, and everyone knew it. So what they did is that they gave uh, uh, a literally a, an hourglass to the experts and told them, you cannot go above five minutes in your answers to the, the citizens, otherwise you'll get cut off. So what do the experts do under those new constraints? They talk much faster. And not, on, not only do they talk much faster, they tell you they're going to talk much faster. So the, the, the lack of awareness is striking. Um, then we had a, lawyer, a session with the lawyers at noon on, uh, on Saturday, October 5, uh, which was an encounter with five members of the legalistic committee that was supposed to help uh, citizens understand how you write the law. So we have two lawyers, beautifully dressed, uh, with strategic bursts of colors, you know, a tailored green vest for the Greenpeace uh, activist, a neon pink scarf for the state councilor. People used to, you know, mastering their, the, the, the way their appearance works and impresses people, uh, talk to the, in, in plenary to the 150. So the, the state councillor presents a long, pictureless PowerPoint on the hierarchy of norms in French law. I look around, very few people take notes. One person falls asleep on their table. You have a sense that people are hungry, uh, distracted. I put myself zoning out at times. I can't follow all that jargon. It's just very difficult. The next day, that's confirmed by the, the mood boards that are uh, collected on Sunday morning. You get people saying, uh, there's too much expert talk, they speak too fast, the legal presentation was too boring and difficult. Yet, 
what's interesting is that to my surprise, at the end of this long presentation by the lawyer, uh, by the state counselor, the first question was this. In the table of the hierarchy of norms, you did not note the place of contract. This was a 50-year-old man um, who asked that question. So I was blown away by this very specific informed question. Um, and, and in fairness, all the other questions were all the same caliber. And I was wondering, how is the expert going to handle that, that, that curveball, right? So here is um, her answer as I translated from the state councillor. It was to enlighten you on what you are going to propose. A priori, you are not going to propose contracts. There are two types of contracts, private contracts and public contracts. But it's not in what you are a priori. Well, that said, yes, that's an excellent idea. Contracts are also part of what you could propose. Contracts between private persons on certain matters. You are right. Don't bridle yourself, yourselves, you are right. And I thought that was an amazing 180 degree reversal of, uh, of the expert's position prompted by just one naive, innocent question um, from, from, the, from the audience. So it showed that um, citizen expertise can come to reveal a blind spot in the expert thinking, or at least a tendency to limit the realm of the possible and unduly narrowing the deliberative space for citizens. So experts do that, and I've seen it over and over again. They box things in, they box people in, they box thoughts in, and what, what citizens do by asking all these questions is reopen the box, take the thinking out of it. So uh, that said, I also observed something interesting on the part of experts, which I which is to their credit, is that they very quickly adjusted, um, at least on, during the first session. They came in, all of them, they came in with the, almost all of them, with the habitus and attitude one expects of experts. Confidence, long witness technicality, um, authority, charisma, etc. But then confronted with the questions, they realized they were dealing with capable and smart people. And We saw it with um, uh, another expert named Benoit Legge, who was the first to introduce himself to the entire uh, room as a human being. He said, I'm not just an expert, I'm a human being. So I'll introduce myself as such. I'm 43, I have three kids. And he instantly broke the tension in the room. It, it's, it sort of um, broke that wall between the expert on one hand and the citizen on the other. Um, it, the adjustment also happened with, with um, another expert who I'm not going to name, but whose name contains a particle, which is a, you know, a, a very significant in the French context. It's from somebody who's probably noble um, uh, ascendancy, uh, uh, CEO of a very prestigious company. So he was used to talking down to people. It was very clear from the way he addressed the room. He started pontificating about climate change since the dawn of times and the dinosaurs and, and the different types of hurricanes. And, and then he was brutally interrupted by a citizen who heckled from the room, who said to him, uh, we already heard all of this yesterday. Can you get to the point? What prevents governments and companies from acting on the knowledge we have uh, about how to fight climate change? And you could tell he was uh, crestfallen and chastened, but to his credit, he immediately adjusted and um, fell in line for the rest of his talk, and he was overall quite good after that. So what was striking to me, for me during this first session is how transformative this type of uh, assembly can be for all the parties involved. The citizens who feel empowered, who feel entitled to cutting off you know, experts and asking very specific questions of them, but also the experts um, as well as the organizers, actually. So now I'm going to jump to session four. The first three sessions, I think, were about that. They were about the empowerment of citizens, the, 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 their self-discovery, their, their discovery of themselves as a group. They sort of um, culminated with very emotional moments in, um, in session three. But then session four, five, six to me felt like um, pushed back from the experts, from the hierarchy, from the governance committee, from the organizers, trying to contain and reconquer control, and, and then in turn a pushback from the citizens. Um, so in session four, what is striking to me is that there was a conflict around uh, sovereignty over the text. Who is the author of the text that they're going to um, put forward to the, to the president? Uh, so for example, in the housing group, which is a subgroup of, of, the, uh, of 30 people within this convention, also randomly selected, 
uh, focused on, on housing issues. Uh, there was a point at which um, uh, an expert crossed the line between giving advice and uh, expressing personal normative views, right? So she, this expert um, basically reminded quite strongly and, and a bit paternalistically uh, the citizens and they had to take into account a budget constraint that, uh, you know, in parliament, elected representatives are not allowed to vote a law that spends money without explaining where the money to fund that expense is going to come from. And so she told them, you're calling for a lot of expenses. If your convention makes the French deficit go up to 10% of, uh, of the, um, to 10%, the, the president will say, I can't sink friends and he won't do it. Citizens really reacted strongly to what they felt as a, as a paternalistic admoni admonishment. Uh, one of them immediately said, I can't believe this. It's your interpretation. Leave the president alone. Who is this lady? Why doesn't she introduce herself? For whom is she working? There was a lot of suspicion from the citizens uh, towards experts who had worked for like oil companies or you know, uh, companies that were not um, uh, particularly environment friendly. So another citizen pursued that line of, of, of you know, uh, questioning, even though he disagreed with the way his first citizen had, had expressed himself. He said, I quote, I understand we should pay attention to funding, but to focus on that now is a little too quick. We are going to think of it. We will find solutions. Do not hurry us. Um, so again, a sense that for the citizen, the expert had, had closed the box too soon, put constraints on their thinking too soon. Later in the same group, another clash. Um, that's about, again, this, this question of uh, sovereignty over the text, a little, little um, physically. So the group was commenting on the PowerPoint document projected on the screen where um, the organizers were writing down all the citizens' ideas. But at one point, the organizer um, overrode part of the text by citizens with an addendum that was inspired by what the expert had just said, and they colored it in red. So um, the citizen rises and says, uh, this wasn't written by us. He gets up, he hits the screen, and he says, not everyone agrees with the idea of a carbon price. Put the opinion of the expert next to this idea, but do not mix it with our text. We didn't write this. And I, that was very uh, tense uh, as, a, as a moment. And I think it, it really says something about the, the difficulty of, of uh, I mean, the, the need to keep those constituencies apart. That the, the, if this, the citizens are in charge and the text is theirs, and whatever the expert says should be added in the margin as a comment, not blended in uh, seamlessly with, uh, with the rest of the text. Um, because this was perceived as a, as a breach of sovereignty, a takeover by the experts, which, which I think it was. Um, now, let me comment on session five. So session five is also uh, another step in the, in the sort of progressive takeover by experts. Between, between session four and five, there had been webinars and a lot of additional meetings that not all the citizens attended with the legal team to help phrase certain things better. To, so, so what happens on, on the morning of, of, uh, of uh, the first day of session five is that people come in and they're given thick piles of documents that have been written by the organizers and the experts. And they're supposed to work on that as the new basis of their work. And as a group of researchers, we were all very surprised by how technical the, the, the texts were and how new some of the contents seemed to us. Um, and of course, we didn't all attend all the webinars, so we we're not sure, but at least one of us did. And uh, she reported that, for example, she had never seen or heard during the, the, these meetings discuss things like um, the, the, temp the maximal temperature of uh, washing machines discussed, you know, like this reached a degree of, of um, accuracy that didn't feel like it came from the citizens. Um, and interestingly, um, in the afternoon, there was a plenary where the organizers felt the need to justify this, this um, strong influence of the, of, the, of the experts. And so the experts spoke and they kept saying, Oh, we had lots of time to work, so we gave us a, you gave us a very specific mandate, so we, gave, we, we started from your ideas, but we also wanted to give you more choices. Uh, we don't want to tell you what to do. We're at your disposal. They kept saying that. We're at your disposal. We're at your disposal. But the reality is that th th this was much more than being at the disposal. This was clearly uh, taking charge. 
So meanwhile, the citizens themselves seem to accept that in, in part. Um, some other researchers mentioned that um, since the visit of the president on, at the end of the first session, the fourth session, citizens had been a little bit more docile, more respectful of authority, more uh, perhaps more overwhelmed by the task and more ready to give in to the experts. Um, uh, yet, at the same time, they also kept fighting amongst themselves over value issues like how much um, um, coercion do we want? Do we really want to force everyone in France to renovate their, uh, their housing, you know, their accommodations, uh, lest they be fined or, or you know, um, punished in some other way? Or do we want to work on more institutive, insti you know, in, on incentives, basically? So it's a huge debate. It's interesting because among the experts, there was almost absolute consensus that uh, uh, pure incentivization wasn't going to work and that we need to go punitive and very coercive. So <clears throat> another thing that's really interesting is at the end of session five, they, uh, on the Saturday, they had two boxes in which they could uh, um, give back the documents with notes on them so that the legalistic team could look at them and integrate their feedback. And you had one pile that said, uh, I don't understand everything, I need more um, explanation or more, more, more work needs to be done on the text. And another pile which said, no, I'm fine, I understand everything. And very quickly it became clear that most of the documents returned and did in the I understand everything pile. So there was a, a, an extreme um, increase in the expertise of the citizens, or at least a, a perceived expertise. They thought they understood the text, they thought they were on top of things and that, uh, you know, they, they agreed with the content. And that's really also something that was really clear in the sixth session. So the sixth session, I unfortunately, I couldn't go because of, as, um, you know, stranded here because of COVID-19, but they still met. Um, and, I, <clears throat> and, and what happened there is that there started to be a rebellion from the citizens against, so not just, not really the experts per se, actually, although they, they, there were some, some, some questions about the wording, but now with a different kind of expert that, that, that also played a role, which were the organizers, so the civic participation experts, really had a, a lot of impact on how things went. And, um, uh, and the governance committee, which was sort of ruling this whole assembly from the top, and included mostly um, uh, experts, participation and, and, and democracy experts, and members of the CESO who are uh, representatives of professional associations. And they started to rebel against the fact that they had no say about how they run their own meetings, about the, the, the exercises they were told to do, very, you know, like, like told like children, really. And, uh, and especially against the fact that um, they were given a text to that was going to be sent to the entire uh, French public that had been in fact written by organizers rather than themselves, even as some citizens in the room said, look, look, we have a draft. Can we look at our draft instead? That's something we wrote. And that was completely discarded. Um, so so you, you sense all these like, you know, power conflicts within the, the structure, the expert-based structure without and within, and the citizens themselves who are, who have become experts of a kind and have started to uh, appropriate their own sovereignty and want more of it. Um, and, and, and then the, the six and a half session, which was not the final session, was also online. And it was about uh, something that, again, the governance committee kind of forced on the citizen, which was they wanted them to take a position on the recovery plan for France after COVID-19. And so huge pushback on how that this, this had been done, on the decision procedure that had been uh, uh, enforced on them and so this was really conflictual and I, I know from uh, sources there that there was equal you know conflicting sort of uh, clashes happening on the governance committee at this point so just to say that I think um, among the question of experts uh, that that expert and citizen relationship raised that of uh, who's really governing these assemblies of ordinary citizens and I and I think at the end we we have to go towards a model where they are self-ruling, where they have their own you know, administration, uh, protocols, constitution, procedures, and they don't need to be told what to do in, in the way that the, the French model sort of did it. Uh, in conclusion, I, again, this is all very preliminary. I, I think there's a lot more that, that needs to be um, uh, done and experimented with to conclude anything, but my, and maybe those conclusions will seem obvious, but I think they're important nonetheless. One, experts um, close questions. That's what they do. They, they, they box things in, they order things, but there's a great loss um, 
of, uh, uh, of perspectives and information and, and, and uh, ideas that happen when experts uh, are in charge. By contrast, citizens keep reopening those questions uh, and not only that, something I didn't have time to touch on, but they reopen them with empathy and uh, with, with humanity. And it's something that also gets um, completely erased in, in expert discourse. Second, experts always tend to drift from advice to control. It's, it's just, um, it's not their fault. I think it's just uh, something that happens and that needs to be... Uh, 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 prevented by creating the right kind of institution, procedure, protocols, and reiterating over and over the message that they are there to serve and that they're, they're, they're there to be on top and not on top. Meanwhile, citizens tend to oscillate, at least in the French experiment, between the habitus of deference towards experts, which is very strong in French culture, uh, and a rebellion against vertical authority, which is also very, very French, actually. So it could be that this is all very peculiar to the French culture, but I, I'm not sure. I think it's a little bit more general than that. Uh, and so how do you manage to, you know, maintain them in the right middle where they are um, uh, respectful of, of the expertise of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of experts, but at the same time, completely aware that they are the one in charge, ultimately? And so the last point I'd make is that to gain in openness and to maintain openness over time, which is, I think, essential to the epistemic quality of the decision uh, we make in the end, collectively, we must resolutely invert the hierarchy expert citizen by creating, again, procedures and protocol that keep experts humble and empower citizens. And that probably means giving them decision power over the way they conduct their meetings and the choice of experts they, they are meant to, to they are made to consult, uh, and it's the form of transfer of power um, from uh, these uh, institutions that want to do, you know, uh, participation and popular consultation, but never really surrender the reins. So that's what I, I think we, we have to have. If we want to get the benefits of crowd wisdom, citizen deliberation, we need to give them actual power. And um, I will end here. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Alan. Thanks a lot. It's um, it's great to hear about uh, uh, assemblies like that. The tensions are always so interesting, and the the tension you're describing between the experts and the um, and the citizens is is really uh, great. Very interesting to hear that. Um, so I want to ask Brentan Hogan to uh, begin with a short comment on your talk, and then we'll go over to questions. Brentan. Okay, thank you, Ellen. Um, really wonderful and rich presentation of uh, an actual sort of experiment in um, what you framed as the sort of tension between democracy and epistocracy. I want to just ask a few questions and open it up as um, quickly as possible. But, um, you know, I wonder if we might think about retiring the antithesis between democracy and epistocracy or democracy versus agriculture. I think some of what you're saying is moving in that direction. And clearly the larger debates do make this kind of antithesis, but I think it's a false antithesis um, in particular because there are so many resources um, in a variety of traditions. The one I'm most familiar with is the sort of pragmatic political theory um, that a lot of the sort of trajectory of your comments and, and some of the actual normative requirements that you point towards in order for these citizen assemblies to succeed uh, resonate with. Um, so um, I just wonder about that sort of um, retiring of that antithesis, even though it is alive and well. Um, and this leads to a second concern with how we frame experts. Um, we talk about expert knowledge and clearly experts in different scientific fields have knowledge with regard to a subject matter um, that is highly specialized, takes a lot of training and takes a lot of years to achieve. Um, but when we shift to social questions or, or social problems, um, those types of refined expert knowledge have to go through some type of transformation to become applicable to a particular social problem. So 
In other words, you might say the experts don't really have knowledge about the particular problem they're addressing until they actually get citizen input with respect to the fabric of the social problem they're dealing with. I mean, that's a maybe general way to put it, but I do think that that's part of the framing of this technocracy versus democracy issue that sort of gets us off on the wrong track because it seems as though they do have knowledge, but it's not knowledge about what to do. It's not practical knowledge, in, in other words. Um, and that distinction between practical and um, sort of expert knowledge, I think, is a significant one. Um, so those are just questions about framing sort of the, re and also pointing towards the requirements for the types of citizen assembly, um, expert citizen uh, combinations you were detailing and were very interesting. With respect to those, um, I wonder, in terms of the lottery uh, process, in terms of selecting citizens, for those assemblies, um, were there sort of specific efforts made to um, include, were they inclusive in terms of different social categories that are relevant to issues, say, of justice with respect to race and class, educational background, these types of things? I was just curious about that. Um, and, um, Finally, um, and, then, and then we can open it up to other questions. I, I do wonder, and you addressed it, um, it is a very specific example of citizen assemblies that you're giving us a very rich description of. And I do wonder when we think about providing a kind of general and theoretical idea about how to provide um, more democratic input to our problem-solving activities. When we look at the French example, how specific culturally is it? And um, secondly, so just a social scientific question about how generalizable is this? Mm -hmm. uh, and, but secondly also, you did mention a number of things very familiar to, um, you know, more th thicker or, or more thick democratic theories uh, with respect to uh, humility, fallibilism, right, and a kind of willingness uh -huh. to revise one's position that experts... Can you repeat the last question? Sorry? Can you repeat? It broke, so I didn't hear the last question. Oh, just, just that... Um, it does seem that even though I'm asking you to sort of handle the question about how particular is this with respect to a social, scientific, or theoretical conclusion, it also does seem that there are some generalizable habits that are necessary, in scare quotes, to motivate a kind of democratic project of citizen expert reflection and pro social problem solving, fallibilism, humility, willingness to revise one's position, um, the courage to speak out in the face or in, and overcome one's natural deference, uh, resisting the idea to rebel, right? These two sorts of um, mm -hmm. tensions in French culture. So I, I, I um, wonder about getting a richer description of those, those types of habits. I have other sorts of questions about the overall connection with this trajectory with what we might call experimentalist models of democracy. But um, I think that's enough, and I, I'd love to hear the other questions too. So um, thanks. Thank you. Should I answer that right away, or how do you yeah, proceed? Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you so much. Um, so I, I tend to, so this idea of retiring the dichotomy between democracy and epistocracy, I, it's tempting, but I think, I don't think we'd be, we would be well served uh, by that, because at the end of the day, we need to be able to tell the difference between a regime where people with no credentials whatsoever can have a say and regimes where in order to have a say, you need to show you know something or take a test or, or be plucked from, you know, uh, from the crowd by, uh, by the Communist Party or something, you know? So, so it's, it's still useful um, to distinguish between the things. And also because, yes, we could say, well, experts is, is a term that is, you know, wrongly reserved to people with certain kinds of credentials. After all, you could be someone who, uh, uh, you know, 
just learned everything without going to school and, and is, has become de facto an expert and, and even, even, even if they have no diploma from anywhere. And some of the citizens in some ways are experts now of you know, climate change and I mean, not climate change, but some specific uh, law subtopics that they really care about. Um, even though they've never been trained for it, they just train massively during, during nine months at this point. Uh, and yet, I still think that it's important to distinguish between uh, experts, and, and I would reserve the terms to people who have this kind of ex ante credentials, and people who uh, um, gain access to a place like an assembly on zero uh, credentials, just because they, they are part of the community and are equal to the, to the rest of the, you know, of the, of the group. And, and I'll plug that random. So, and that doesn't mean there won't be experts in the first sense in the group because you, you know, you, you could pick a Nobel Prize of physics and they would happen to jo join the group. But as, as uh, Mr. X, they, they, would, they would not be an expert because they would be here on, on the ground that they've been chosen at random, not on the ground that they have a Nobel Prize in physics. So, so, so that's, that's where I think that I would draw the line. I think we still need to, um, uh, but I agree, however, with your point about, well, these experts are actually not knowledgeable about the practical uh, sort of a decision that needs to be, to be made. That's something that only the group, but informed by their local expertise can, can reach. That, that I absolutely agree. So I absolutely agree with. Um, in terms of the lottery aspect of the of the French Convention, well, it, you know, I say a randomly selected, but of course it wasn't uh, one person, one lottery ticket, which would be in some way uh, ideal, but only if the, perhaps the, 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 the assembly was bigger because 150, it's actually a, a small number to, to get a truly statistically representative uh, group, you know, on, 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 on the principle of pure random selection. So what they did is what they do in all these mini publics, they did stratified random sampling, uh, you know, and they used categories that are, um, you know, quite classical. They used the geographic area to make sure they had urban and, and countryside people. They used age, they used uh, education level. Uh, so, 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 so there were people who were working class, uh, uh, there were some marginal people. Um, those I understand didn't last long. Actually, they, they didn't come back. Uh, I think we, the, you know, there's only so much that, that could be done in their case. But at least at the beginning, they really tried on the basis of randomly generated uh, cell phone numbers. Actually, that's how they they got to to get that diversity. Um, I think one one category they undersampled, and I think that would have been better to to at least have a representative number in there. Uh, where the climate change uh, skeptic, you know, they, they, didn't sem they didn't stratify on that dimension. And so you end up with an assembly, which I, in my view is probably way too uh, favorable to, to, you know, to the concept of environmental, um, uh, the, the need to, to, for a green transition and, and things like that. So that might be an issue when they confront the rest of the French population, which will be by default more climate skeptical than, than the assembly itself. Um, but you know, they, just because the, the French design wasn't perfect doesn't mean we couldn't get things right or, or, or slightly better the next time around in a different design. And then uh, what are the generalizable lessons of, from the Convention on Climate Change? Well, it's one of my <laughs> pet peeves that, first of all, this is not constructed in such a way that you can uh, conclude anything causally, you know, it's not, uh, they could have, you know, everything is based on random on random selection. So they could have introduced some experimental design in all of this. So you could have concluded some things about group dynamics and, and the best way to have experts and, uh, and ordinary citizen interact, for example. I pleaded for that. I, I wrote an op-ed that didn't have any impact and <laughs> hopefully it will be heard at some point. Um, but then in terms of more generally, like even from a qualitative perspective, looking at it the way I do, which is through a sort of sociological fine grain analysis, can we learn anything? I think some of the things you said are, are absolutely true. I think that we know that empathy, fallibilism, humility are key values, key um, sort of virtues, in fact, that you want to cultivate in the, in the citizens. But what struck me really, because you know, the French are, are, um, uh, are not people who I think know naturally how to talk to each other. It's, it's always very animated, very uh, angry and very, uh, there's not necessarily much of 
listening, especially amongst people from, from different opinions. But that's not at all what I observed in the context of this assembly. So in part because it was monitored and, and, and organized in such a way that you know, there were facilitators. But even without the facilitators, at, at the table, you had a lot more listening and empathy and, and uh, humility than I, than I thought, uh, than I was prepared to, to witness, even knowing what I already knew about uh, other such experiments elsewhere in the world. So, so I, th I thought that was really interesting. It, the, the, the randomness really takes away the pride that people bring to conversation when they feel entitled because they know something. I, I felt like this was really humbling in a good way for the citizens. Um, and, and, and generally speaking, I think the reason why I think this, these are going to be universal uh, findings or that they can be generalized is because most countries, except perhaps the US, started from a, with a legacy of authoritarianism and top-down control and, and you know, deference towards expertise. And so it's going to, it's going to be a long process to, to re-socialize people towards the other more democratic virtues, you know? just long and, and they teach each other you know when, when people get angry they, they help each other they soothe each other's mood they there's all of that as well that I didn't have time to talk about but it's really moving all right so um, uh, good we have now four uh, people who want to ask Ellen questions and I'm gonna ask them to um, to uh, to ask the questions one after another and then you Ellen to answer them all at once and after that, uh, this will become a round table. So I will ask everyone to, uh, to think while we are w going through the questions that Ellen is now getting. Is there anything you want to uh, draw from today's discussion? Any comment you have on some of the talks during the day or, or, or generally? Um, so first is Albena. Mute. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. Uh, before I ask my question, let me make it very clear. I'm a big fan of deliberative polls. I attended uh, um, a deliberative polls in Hungary 10 years ago when I was writing my book on deliberative judgment. And indeed, it is fascinating to sit in and, and, and do this kind of research. Uh, so I kind of envy you. Um, it's a great experience. But I want to ask you, what in your in your study, what what do you advise that we should consider valid input? And here's what I'm asking, because uh, remember when Macron started the public consultation around the yellow vest um, um, turmoil? Uh, well, they said we want low taxes and he said fine i'm going to listen to the people and give you lower taxes so this is a way this can be very way uh, be used as a, as a as a mechanism of avoiding uh responsibility so it, it, that is why it's important that we define what kind of input we we want from that experimentation before we give it all this value and applause that you know that we that we tend to to give it yeah, we, we tend to see these deliberations as the, as the way to go. Um, so this is my question. What is what you consider valid input? What are we to expect uh, the added value of these things to be? Can I answer that right away? Because that's, I think it's very important. I, 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 don't, I don't want to commit to the substance. I think that it's very important that we don't you know, pick and choose what counts as valid input. So what I'll say is that it depends on how the input was produced. That's what matters. If, it, if it's been produced through processes we can trust to, you know, minimize epistemic uh, catastrophe and, and on the contrary, maximize epistemic quality, we have to trust the process at some point. We cannot just at the end say, oh, well, they say this, I'm not going to listen. Um, I meant valid input into decision making, the valid output of the deliberations into decision making. No, no, but, um, but the, the, you're, you're saying, why should we listen to people who say lower taxes? Well, in the case of the, I, I, so I'm not sure I understand that, but what I, what I also want to say is that it's Macron who said, oh, the French said we, they want lower taxes. That's not what many people and many observers said they read into the, the great national debates, right? You, you, that's a problem of the great national debate. It makes so many consultation methods that in the end, no one knows that to aggregate, you know, 100,000 pages of input from 
town hall meeting like assemblies and the much more structured input of 1400 people involved in regional mini publics and online you know it's just like what do you make all of this you know it right. no, it's exactly what i'm asking i'm, I'm ah. asking what are we to take what is the valid take out that we should feed well, into decision making I, it all depends on the process. If the process is a mess, like the, the great national debate was, you cannot do that much with it. You have to structure it, in my view, with a, uh, a lot of uh, mini publics at the regional level that culminates, that, that, are, that feed input into a, a, a national mini public, and that, that all these things working in consultation with the larger public, but you know, it, it needs to be structured. Um, right. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, what I have discovered in, in, in my research is that these publics were extremely useful in identifying what are the common roots of conflicts that at the beginning appeared to be complete in opposition. Right. You know, in the course of deliberation, they would discover that there is a common engine of that discontent. And I thought that was probably the most valuable takeout. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I feel like that, that, that did come out from the great national debate. I don't want to be totally unfair, actually. I thought it was a really interesting experiment on the whole. But what was interesting is the redundancies uh, in, in what people wanted. And uh, it was a particularly enlightening, I think, in the, in the case of the 21 randomly selected assemblies, because they were all, well, not all of them, so let's say 13 of them were truly random. Um, they converged in their conclusions. They, they, they were held independently. And they converged, including on this question of we need to have new governance models when it comes to climate change. So in a way, it was right of Macron to say, OK, I'm going to have a citizens convention on climate change, because that's actually something that 12 or 13 uh, independently constructed uh, you know, uh, random assemblies of citizens came up with too, you know, that's what they were saying as well. So, so I think the, the redundancy mechanism is also helpful to figure out what, what should count. OK, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Lisa. Yeah, thank you. Um, so when you described how this, these scientists switched from their usual habitus to normal interaction between human beings, I was wondering, you know, why does this only happen when you put them into these highly artificial settings? And of course, you know, I know a little bit about history and sociology of France, so I know why this is, but isn't that a point where you really should ask deeper questions? And I mean, I, I, I have nothing against these deliberative polls, of course, but isn't there a more structural problem about the way in which scientists are socialized and taught that they are more valuable than re the rest of society? And just instead of just saying, look, I'm doing that kind of job and someone else is, is baking bread for us. So, I mean, isn't there a need for structural change? And you mentioned humility and all these things on the part of citizens, but there is even scientific evidence, there is a field uh, called science of science communication. I only discovered this sort of by chance, but there, there are people actually doing research on the effectiveness on science communication, and it all goes in this direction. Humility, coming across as a human being, being warm, not just competent. So, so I mean, there are all these things. So, and, and wouldn't it be much better if we could sort of normalize that kind of more egalitarian attitude and, you know, people talking to each other in their everyday lives in these ways. So I, I find it sort of, I mean, of course, it's, it's nice to have these special spaces, but the question I'm asking myself is, can we learn something from these spaces about how this kind of egalitarian democratic ethos could be made more normal and right. become really part of society? Fantastic okay. question. No, I, I completely agree. I think the answer is education. I think that we need to start, you know, when kids are three year olds and they need to learn to solve, you know, their problems among themselves in a deliberative fashion, respecting each other. And then all the way up to, to university and, and where these people are trained, where there should be a lot more uh, rewards for collective endeavors, for example, because we, 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 we are trained in systems that are super individualistic. They only reward you as an individual rather than you as a member of a team or a, a good colleague. Or So, so that breeds the wrong kind of um, ethos in a way. And, uh, and, I, and I think that there are all these other forces, you know, patriarchy and, and the way, you know, 
looking down at people acting in contentious ways. It's like it's reinforcing certain power structures. So why would people change if they benefit from from this kind of non-constructive attitudes? Um, it, it's I, I think it's way bigger than I than I, when, when I, what I was prepared to talk about. But I that that should be definitely part of a of a reflection about what democracy means and what's a democratic way of life basically. Okay, uh, Just would you be next? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to, to ask about your observations um, about the internal group dynamics uh, that you could observe among citizens. And I was asking myself if you could observe some kind of learning process uh, within the group in the sense of becoming more democratic somehow, listening to more to each other, promoting more equality. And then I would wonder if uh, I would ask you if you, you would say that if there was some kind of this uh, this kind of learning process, if it took place also for epistemic reasons. So, for example, if we want to come to the right answer, we need to listen to each other and so on and so on. Or if it was more about intrinsic values, oh, uh, equality is uh, uh, valuable for it uh, in itself and so. On. Uh, so I, I don't think I observed that people changed because they saw the benefits of changing. No, I think they, that, that I, I wasn't able to pinpoint like examples where somebody thought, oh, the conversation gets better when I'm listening more. You know, no, it, it was more of a uh, mutual education, um, including, you know, like, so I'll give you a um, Two examples. One is um, a woman who um, is a former uh, stutterer, older, older, older lady who never said anything because when you talk to her privately, she tells you know she, she she told the story of being a stutterer and she was brought to tears just remembering it. And so it's not somebody who could speak easily in public. But the group somehow figured out that she was like that and shy about speaking. And and since the organizers, you know, they, they, they are in charge of a a whole room so they can't really monitor each person but they try to bring out some people and make them speak when they were silent so at one point this uh, lady was asked by the organizer to speak up and and she did and it was probably very costly for her and then you know there was like a sense of incredible warmth in the room and somebody said oh i'm not gonna say her name but um you know x you you just spoke it's great you're growing and, and all, it, it was really nice there was a uh, encouragement and, and benevolence and empathy and all of that and <clears throat> can't say that she became a uh, extremely vocal afterwards i mean but she, she there was at least that that element and then w the opposite problem is um so it's it's a little caricature what i'm describing but you know these people are also a lot of them are a certain generation so you know so they it's the, the, the caricatural gender relationships in France are very predictable. The loud man who speaks too much, who cuts off people, who's very angry, overreacts. So. Well, when I met him, I interviewed him and I, and I just didn't like him. I thought, oh, why is he uh, so aggressive? And so I actually asked him why he was so aggressive. And, and, and in fact, it turns out that he has a personal story that's very moving. And again, I'm not going to go into the detail, but he's angry for all kinds of reasons, but mostly because he cares. And it turns out the other people who spent more time with him knew that. So instead of being mad at him, as I thought they would be, they totally embraced him, supported him. And when he had the, this outburst of anger, they would like massage his shoulders and tell him to calm down and take him on the side and they would reconcile. And, 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 uh, and then I heard people say, I admire him. Uh, I love somebody next to me told him to his face, I love you. And then he burst into tears. I mean, this was just, this, this is what's happening. So it's, it's education through examples, through gentle proddings, through, well, not always gentle. There were some conflicts and sometimes they would just say, shut up. And, but it's, um, that's, that's what I saw that happening. Sort of soci socialization to respecting each other and, and listening to each other. Okay, Savage, so you have the, la have the last question now. Okay, great. Um, I just want to say uh, I I love this talk and uh, especially what you were talk saying about the sovereignty of these uh, assemblies, uh, which is something I I think we need to pay a lot of attention to. But what I wanted to ask you about was something small that you mentioned. It was probably not the main point in your talk, but 
uh, about stratification. And you talked about uh, climate deniers uh, and that maybe you should have stratified for, for that eventuality. Um, so this probably relates to a broader sort of subject of what to stratify for, you know. Uh, obviously, I mean, most people are in agreement that we should stratify for gender, but um, when it comes to issues like, uh, like this, I mean, of course, this is the main topic of the assembly, so probably there's a good argument for stratifying for it, but, but nonetheless, you know, how far should we go? So that's, I wanted to maybe ask you to say a few words about that. Yeah, so you're asking, is it, it's the same as saying how many races should you have in an assembly? Like, what's the point, right? Well, um, I tend to think that, you know, if we really are all in this together, then you have to, to uh, listen to people who you think are wrong and um, mm -hmm. as far as you can go, basically. You know, in, in 12 Angry Men, which is a movie I'm very fond of because it illustrates so many of the epistemic properties of, of deliberation that I, that I believe in, they listen to the racist guy only up to a point, right? At some point, they just get up and turn their back on him and it's end of the conversation. But climate change deniers, I, I think it's, I, it's the same. I think they, they, ha they have arguments. They, they, some of them are just, you know, just like, you know, intelligent people with, with strong views. And, and I think that it would be worse to spend at least a session discussing their views and refuting them. And some, some I know, including activists on the governance committee, thought that, Total waste of time. Um, the urgency is there. We, we can't afford that. But I'm just worried that by rushing things like that at the beginning, you're just going to take two steps backwards at the end of the process when some people in the French population will be like, "Whoa, these green ayatollahs! What do they? What are they doing?" And and, uh, and they will feel like their arguments haven't been addressed, and that now if they're going to be forced to renovate their housing, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. a great cost to themselves, even as, you know, France emits only 1% of, of global green gas emissions, it's going to be really a hard sale. Whereas if you take the time to bring people on board, and actually that's what happened um, a little bit. I mean, I, I think another flaw of the, the Citizens' Convention, I think, is that it was not... Um, uh, it was too consensus-oriented and not carefully enough about preserving and cultivating mm -hmm. disagreements so that, you know, you really make sure everybody's on board at the end. At least a self-described climate climate skeptic and came out not uh, no longer a climate skeptic, but, but convinced that something needs to be done somehow. So uh, he said that on, on French TV, actually. That was quite funny. And, uh, and he, he's also somebody who's been completely transformed. He came skeptical, broken by life and other mm -hmm. things. He came out, now he's gonna run, uh, I think, uh, a campaign in his, uh, in his city or in his region, I don't know if you remember, but you know, he came in, he, he wouldn't let go of his suitcase the whole first weekend because he thought he was going to leave. You know? He just didn't want to park it anywhere. And, and, and now he's one of the most committed and uh, eager uh, citizens, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Ellen, thanks a lot. You you have you have been answering questions for thirty minutes. That's uh, intense. Um, 